If you like these videos, you can easily support this channel by subscribing, by liking the video, and by leaving comments. Feel free to ask any questions you have or suggest videos you'd like to see in the future. Thanks for the support. Hello. In this video, we will cover 10 useful JavaScript interview questions and answers to know. Let's just jump right in and get started. Question number one. What is scope? A variable that is accessible everywhere has global scope, and a variable that can only be accessed in a particular place has local scope. Let's take a look at this example. At the top here, we have a variable called variable in global scope, and it is accessible both inside the function with local scope function and outside of it. Inside the function with local scope function, there is a variable called variable in local scope, and it is accessible inside the function, but not outside of the function. Question number two, what is hoisting? Hoisting is JavaScript's default behavior of moving variable and function declarations to the top. Here's an example of variable hoisting. In the first example, because the variable x has not yet been defined, it produces an error. In the second example, even though we are console logging the variable x before it is defined, the var x declaration below gets hoisted to the top, so it actually behaves like this. That's why in the second example, x is merely undefined and does not produce an error. Now, here's an example of function hoisting. Function declarations, such as the first example, are hoisted, so we can call the function before it is technically defined. But function expressions, such as the second example, are not hoisted, so we can't call the function before it is defined. Question number three. What is a closure? A closure is basically an inner function that has access to the outer or enclosing function's variables. Let's take a look at this example. Here we have an outer or enclosing function called say hello creator. It returns an inner function called say hello function. And the say hello creator function has a variable in its local scope named greeting. The say hello function has access to the greeting variable and it console logs the greeting variable plus the name variable that we pass into the say hello creator function. So we can now create as many say hello functions as we want for different names easily by simply calling say hello creator with the name of the person we want to say hello to. This closure example helps keep your code concise and clean. We don't need to redefine a new function for every new name that we want to say hello to. Question number four, what is functional programming? Functional programming involves using pure functions that avoid shared state, mutating data, and side effects. It is declarative rather than imperative. Let's break all of this down by comparing these two examples. In the first example, the object has state that is shared with the two functions below, and the two functions below mutate the object itself, which means that they also produce a side effect. And since the functions use state that is outside of themselves, what they return is pretty unpredictable. In the second example, the object is not shared or mutated at all. The two functions below don't mutate the object, but rather take the object as an argument, and then they make a copy of the object, and then perform the operation on the copy of the object. So, unlike in the first example, we always know exactly what the functions will return, based on what we pass in. Question number five. What is the difference between synchronous and asynchronous code? Synchronous code is blocking, or must complete before anything else can happen. An asynchronous code is not blocking, which means that things can move on while we wait for something to finish. Asynchronous JavaScript utilizes callbacks to do this. Asynchronous code is faster and allows for a better user experience because we don't need to wait for things to finish before we can move on. Instead, we can just move on, and when things finish, then we can do what we need. Let's take a look at an example that compares the two. In the first example, the three lines of code run in order. The next line can't run unless the one before it completes. In the second example, we see that three is logged before two, even though two shows up earlier in the code. This is because set timeout is an asynchronous operation. It waits for the amount of time that we specify before running the function inside of it. The inner function is called a callback because it is called later when things are ready. Question number six. How can you determine if something is an array? If we do type of and then an array, we get object, so that doesn't work. Instead, we can use the constructor property to solve this problem. 
If we do an array dot constructor, we get the global array constructor. So we can do array dot constructor equals capital array to determine if something is an array. Question number seven. What is a higher order function? A higher order function is a function that can take another function as an argument or that returns a function as a result. Higher order functions are a key component of functional programming. As we learned earlier, a closure is a kind of higher order function. Let's take a look at an example of a function that takes another function as an argument. This example basically implements the native for each method for arrays. We can see here that the for each function accepts an array and an iterator, which is a function. Then below, we are calling the for each function with an array for the first argument, and then an iterator function for the second argument. The iterator function is called for each item in the array, and for each item, it is passed the value of the item and the index of the item. Question number eight. What is the difference between an array and an array-like object? An array-like object does not have the standard array methods, but an array can be created from it with array.from. Let's take a look at an example. In the first example, the arguments variable is an array-like object, and when we try to use the for each method that is available for arrays, we get an error. In the second example, we create an actual array from the array-like arguments variable, so now the for each method works. Question number nine. What is type coercion? JavaScript sometimes allows something of a particular type to be coerced into another type. Here are some examples. In the first example, the eight is a number, but it is coerced into a string, so there is no type error that results. In the second example, the double equal sign allows the two eights even though one is a string and one is a number, to be counted as equal to one another by coercing the types to be the same. Question number 10. What is the difference between two-way data binding and one-way data flow? Two-way data binding means that fields such as inputs in the UI are bound to the model data such that when either the UI or the model data changes, the other one is also updated with it. Two-way data binding can cause side effects that are difficult to debug. One-way data flow means that there is a single source of truth, and changes to that single source of truth can only flow in one direction. With one-way data flow, it is easier to understand what is happening with the data, and therefore easier to debug. React slash Redux is a good example of a pattern that uses one-way data flow. So that's the end of this video. Hopefully you found these questions and answers helpful. If you have more questions and answers you'd like me to cover, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I'll see you next time.